Tonight uh, we have a very special guest, uh, uh, Karen in particular uh, being uh, an expert uh, in the State Department before uh, I got involved in the Soviet Union activities, uh, has uh, been familiar with the outstanding work of Dr. Martha Brill Alcott. She has written seven books on Central Asia, the Caspian region, and Southern Russia in general. She has written hundreds of articles and uh, she is widely considered uh, throughout the, the expert, quote unquote, community as the leading American expert on Central Asia, on the effect of Islamic fundamentalism in, throughout uh, that tier of countries that runs all the way from Syria through Central Asia and beyond. And so we're very, very privileged to have uh, a leading expert here to talk to this very fine crowd. And so I want to welcome Dr. Martha Rill Alcott. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, somewhat humbling to be speaking in front of all these people. Um, what I'd like to do tonight in the time that I have, which is about 35 minutes, is talk about <coughs> whether ISIS is a danger for Central Asia. And I want to do it actually through going through materials that I think um, are useful to understand, first of all, what ISIS is, and look at the roots of its, what I understand, what has caused it. Um, and I come off teaching two years of, of having gone through the material on ISIS in the Middle East the past two years as I teach at MSU, uh, going back to a region that I had worked on for so many years before the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I want to do two things. I want to look at the causes of ISIS's rise, then I want to take you to Central Asia and show you the kinds of risks of similar phenomenon occurring in Central Asia, um, and then offer some conclusions. Uh, first, I think, and I, technologically I'm running the slide separate from my computer, so I apologize if I forget to forward it. Um, I want to look at the causes of ISIS's rise. Um, and again, my, I'm coming to it from the point of view of somebody who has uh, made a serious study of Islam and politics, as opposed to somebody who is looking at it from the point of view of terrorism and the rise of terrorism. So I'm really interested in the kinds of um, the, the kinds of stimuli that exist in region uh, that, in my mind, has caused this current wave of Islamic fundamentalism, which as I go forward, you'll see, I see as part of a whole dynamic in Sunni Islam. Um, <clears throat> while the causes vary from region to region and from country to country, I think that for us to understand the na nature of ISIS and the threat it may pose elsewhere, we have to look at the causes that are related to state collapse. Um, state collapse comes in, in different ways in the Middle East. It's come in three ways, um, through outside intervention. And I do believe that the uh, invasion of Iraq and the kind of rebuilding that occurred or didn't occur uh, was a major action that shaped the kinds of balances between the various ethnic and religious communities. Dynastic fatigue, and this I think is really the case in Syria, um, and a combination of both. Then I think that actions of outside actors become really critical. Um, here I really want to draw attention, and I think this is true in the Middle East and really true in Central Asia as well, that 
as actors, as outside actors intervene, and, and this is true, be it the US or Russia or Europe or China and Central Asia, there are certain presuppositions about what the populations in the countries they're intervening, and intervening need not just be military. Um, can be a major economic intervention as well. There are presuppositions of what populations want, and varying, and I would argue, oftentimes very incomplete understandings of what constitutes legitimacy, loyalty, or ideology in these settings. So outside actors, as they've intervened in the Middle East and as they intervene in Central Asia, come in with one set of understandings of what they think the populations of these countries want. And these understandings are shaped in part by their interlocutors from these countries. So if their interlocutors are biased or if their interlocutors themselves are people that don't think they know what the populations are thinking and need not know what the populations are thinking, and I find that all the time in Central Asia, um, then I, I think that you have this risk of actions um, of assumptions being made about political stability and, and political loyalty that don't necessarily hold up. And finally, I think that we have to be aware of what the very existence of foreign troops on any country's soil, um, how that's interpreted in a country. And that's true of Iraq, it's true of the Russians in Ukraine, it's true of Russia now in Syria. That any of these interventions or any of these um, actions have his have future implications that are very difficult, that have proven very difficult to predict by the outside actors themselves. I think that what it's really important to understand, and I'm going to show you two maps, again, forgetting to forward. The first is, and these will be available on a YouTube write-up of today's talk, so I can't expect you to identify all the pictures. Um, what I'm trying to do here is show the two points of commonality between the Central Asian countries and the Middle East as we look forward to what can, might happen in the future. The first is the incredible ethnic mosaic of the countries that we're dealing with. Um, yellow represents Arabs, Jews are, you see Israel, Jews are light orange and tangerine. Um, then you have Christian communities in the various shades of green um, or non-Islamic, and then the dark green is Islamic. I mean, so what you get is, is these, it's, it's a complete lack of cultural homogeneity. The next slide is <coughs> the Middle East as it appeared in 19, um, six, right after the Sykes-Picot Treaty in 1916. And what I'm trying to show in this slide, and again, it will be parallel when we move to Central Asia, is the ways in which states were drawn. I mean, the maps of states drawn in these places is not in any way a superimposition of state boundaries on top of um, ethnic boundaries. So you have, again, artificial, I, I've had this argument with my students when they said the Arabs should have decided what they wanted in 1916. Um, Artificial is really, I think, the wrong term. If we go back to the previous map, you see how difficult it would have been to draw anything like ethnically consolidated communities. But, uh, so it's easy to stand here now and fault what was done a hundred years ago. It's about to be the 100th anniversary celebration in Kurdistan for the Sykes-Picot Treaty. Um, but it, the fact is that the kinds of, ideology and state loyalty that has been formed over the past hundred years, it need not be insignificant, but it is felt to different degrees among different communities and different actors in these countries, and different forms of shock can be disruptive to it. Let me go to the next slide, which should take me to Central Asia. Yes, it does, sorry. Um, I now want to move to the five countries of Central Asia, and these are the former five Soviet republics of Central Asia. I could spend all night telling you the background history, so instead I will sort of torture history into a tiny sound bite. I mean, these five countries of Central Asia came under Russian rule in the 19th century. Um, <coughs> the heart where you see it as Uzbekistan, kind of yellow, is really um, the ancient Indo-European population of the area originally lived there. They're 
the pink and the yellow there. Uh, you, from the time of, uh, you have Islamic civilizations in this region from the time of the Arab conquest in the seventh century. Um, it was a major seat of civilization, Islamic civilization, not during the Arab empires, but during the Islamic empires that followed up until the invasion of the Mongols in the 12th, up until the 12th century. So it has a real cultural, I mean, it, it is the heart of the, a heart of the Islamic world, a major part of the Islamic empire for 500 years. Um, as I say, they came under Russian rule in the 19th century. The area roughly divided into Turkestan, the, the, which was everything in the middle, the Kazakh steppe above. And then the Soviets came in in the 1920s and divided it up into the five republics that you see on this map, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, um, which became five independent states. But what you see from this map and the the purplish ones are Russian, um, the, the pink ones are Tajik or Indo-European, the Uzbeks are orange and the Kazakh, and the Kazakhs, um, the Kyrgyz are brown. And you see that these populations are all mixed together. Um, and none of these countries are ethnically consolidated, much like the Middle East. And you have had, and the next map will show religious makeup. Although the overwhelming part of the population, that's the light green, is Hanafi. All the greens are Muslim. <laughs> the light green are the Hanafi school of Sunni Islam, and, and the darker green are, are not, or other Muslim communities, as are the, um, the ones with the horizontal lines drawn through. Um, but what you see, is that, with the exception of the Christian populations, ethnicity and religion don't fully overlap. And that kind of Islam practiced among the different populations, the sedentary populations, the Uzbeks, for example, um, and the Tajiks, they have had a tradition in which religion has been much more um, preserved under Soviet rule. They, they've had, I mean, I wrote a book about this. They've had much less discontinuity in the transmission, not just of religious practice, but religious teachings, even if the bulk of the population did not have a religious education. So religion and ethnicity, much like it does in the Middle East, create um, real frictions when they, when they don't fully overlap. So ethnicity can divide the population, but religion can further deepen the cleavages from, con from community to community. With that as background, I I'm gonna give you just a fast overview of Central Asia before I take you back to the Middle East. Um, <coughs> again, if the Middle East is a place in which all the great powers have intervened or been present in, in a pretty major way because of the importance of the resources in the area. Central Asia is defined by a place of rel as a place of relative geographic isolation. The great powers talk a lot, especially the US and EU, um, but really the powerful geopolitical partners are Russia and China, and they both have very, very strong stakes in the area. They're both border countries, Russia the historic country, China the current economic power. Um, so when we talk about further down the line, any sort of external interventions in the region, we're really talking about likely interventions of Russia or less likely an intervention by China. It is a very dangerous neighborhood because of its proximity to Afghanistan. Until ISIS came to the forefront a few years ago, the major source of Islamic radicalization in this area was through Afghanistan, either first in Afghanistan until after 2001, and then Pakistan increasingly, the area near Afghanistan, where the remnants of what was called the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, which joined both with global jihadist groups and with the Taliban, um, where they were based. Um, but now, the Middle East itself, as I will talk more about, has become an important source 
of direct radicalization. Uh, you have at the time of the civil, you, you have at the time of the creation of independence 25 years ago, a major civil war in Tajikistan, and that civil war engaged both Tajikistan and fighters coming from Uzbekistan, and the Islamic movement around these people uh, went into Afghanistan and then sort of joined the global jihad. Mixing in with these people were people from the long-standing war in Chechnya. And both of these groups, I mean, the Chechens have gone to the Middle East as trainers in, in ISIS camps. And again, when you see the, the recruiting posters, and I, I did a lot of work on recruiting before 2001, where Russian was a, a major language of recruitment for fighters throughout this region. Um, and now you have recruiting for ISIS in both the native languages and still in Russian. Um, even if Russian is less widespread in the current generation, Russian is the one language that you can expect people from throughout the Muslim parts of Russia and throughout the Caucasus and Central Asia to still have some likelihood of understanding. People, before they go to jihad, are unlikely to understand fluent Arabic, so you have to have recruitment in some other language. What do you have in this area? And this is one of the reasons as I'm, in my own work as I'm moving forward to write about this stuff in a new book. Um, I, I'm really struck by the, the ways in which there are similarities between the political structure of Central Asia and the political structure in the Middle East, really, in the past 20 years. Uh, you have aging political leaders in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Tajikistan, where the least, the person who served the least is the president of Tajikistan, and he's been in power 24 years. <laughs> the others have been in power 26 and 27. There are men who are approaching 80. They're in, in two of these three countries, there's a real prospect of dynastic transfer of power. You've already had that in Azerbaijan, but just like you had in Syria. You have minimal opportunities for, for political participation, much as you have throughout the Middle East. Um, you have, and I didn't put this down on the slide, you have a decreasing, a, a middle class that's under great stress. I sound like a rally for the, <laughs> for either of the parties. Um, <laughs> but, but, and maybe it also follows here too, they're also less likely to be secular. So not only are they fewer in number, but, they're, but religion is playing a greater role in the, in the lower middle class, the working class, and in the middle class. Um, it, so there's increasing control of religion. I mean, religion has come back, obviously, in public life. But the structural mechanisms of controlling religion, Christianity as well as Islam, but I'm much more focused on Islam for the purposes of this talk, um, and it is the majority faith, <coughs> are very Soviet era. So what you find is the structures, the state is the place that defines who are accepted clerics and how the faith should be practiced. And here I think there is great parallel with the Middle East. I think we often ignore the degree to which Religion is under state control in the Middle East as well. The content of the faith differs in, from Central Asia. Obviously, it's a much less pious society, and religion in public life plays a more circumscribed role. Um, but even in Saudi Arabia, the state authorities are the ones who choose the religious authorities. And in Egypt, that's certainly the case. We see this in Syria. Um, and part of the reason you have the rise of uh, the, the rise of the most radical forms of Sunni Islam, and I'm going to talk more about that in the next slide, in a place like Syria, is the Sunni clerics stayed with Assad quite far into the civil war. So into the first six months of civil war, you have Sunni clerics who were supporting Assad as Assad was killing Sun, you know, the Sunni population. Um, you have that same potential in Central Asia. Again, it's structurally very, very similar. Again, and everything on this also shows up in the Middle East or North Africa. The aging political leaders was certainly the case in Tunisia and Libya both. Youthful population, <laughs> no, they're not just young and fit, they're overwhelmingly under 21. 
Um, so you have large parts, and I could give you statistics from each country, but not by heart. But it, it goes up to about 60 in the most youth-oriented, um, the skewed demographics. And birth rates have fallen appreciably since the end of the Soviet Union. But even still, you're running 60 and 65 percent of a population in the most youthful of these countries that are under 21, and a majority generally that's under 18. Declining educational quality. All of these places throughout the region, the quality of primary and secondary education for the overwhelming majority of the population has um, declined dramatically. And this is a question I've done a lot of work. I've, I've visited a lot of schools with a community project I've been engaged in. I always say when the last Soviet era principal retires, that's it, you know, it's like you're really going to have, you have a return, you don't have a return to widespread illiteracy, but all of these countries had complete literacy, you know, 100% or 99% change. Now you don't have that anymore, and it's becoming an increasing problem. Sometimes it's problems of documentation that people lack so they don't go to school. And the quality of education, partly it's a switch to national language education, um, and not that inherently that has to be bad, um, but it, it just means you don't have textbooks necessarily in all the subjects you're teaching in. They've discarded Soviet era textbooks. I mean, you shouldn't be counting, you shouldn't be doing arithmetic, you know, with examples from the Communist Party, but it's very expensive to duplicate all this. Corruption's been a big problem through these areas, a much greater problem than in the Soviet period, where classic industry, you know, with certain industries were highly corrupt, but education, except for bribing your way into higher education institutions, wasn't as, as corrupt, certainly not at the first, second, and third grade level. There wasn't manifest corruption, but now you can find it at every level. Um, and, and, and girl, poverty is increasing, so people don't always have the winter clothing to go to schools. So it's really, it's a, it's a serious problem. Diminishing economic opportunities at home, again, another major problem. Um, economic diversification in the energy-rich countries hasn't worked as well as they have liked. And, <laughs> And, edge, and political control has generally, I mean, this is a, a gross oversimplification because there's more subtlety across the region, but the, the goal of political control has been more important than the goal of complete marketization. That's not to say that if they, in a place like Uzbekistan, had gone to complete marketization, you wouldn't have had social unrest. That certainly could have been there too. So what you have is diminishing economic opportunities. In some places, you've created strong security states, like in Egypt. I mean, Egypt is a strong security state. We've seen this. Uzbekistan is a strong security state. But a lot of these places are weak security states. So what happens in a weak security state when, the, you know, when it begins to unfold? Uh, unravel, that's what we saw at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union. So you have migration for employment, and Russia's the major source of employment. So Tajiks, Uzbeks, Kyrgyz um, are dependent upon employment in Russia from any place between 15%, which is probably an artificially low figure, to 50%, which is probably a much more realistic figure of the GDP. Um, and that's remittances coming home. Russia has also been a source of radicalization for the worker, the guest workers, because Islam that's practiced there can be much more radical. Okay, now I'm moving back to the Middle East for the next three slides, and I'm watching the time. Um, okay, I've changed slides on both machines. I think it's really important as we talk about this, I'm gonna take you back now and talk some more generally about Islam. I think it's, <laughs> there's this, it, and again, I hear it in the classroom, and I hear it when I'm teach, and I also teach in Kazakhstan. I hear it when I teach there. Um, I, I think that there is there is this tendency to say, you know, there are bad Muslims and good Muslims, or there are there, are, and violent extremism can be eradicated by good Muslims. And I really think, and it, that this is a, a serious oversimplification of Sunni Islam, and I'm certainly not coming on this from the point of view of being, you know, clerically trained myself, but I think that it's really important <coughs> to understand that Sunni Islam itself, and this is what's practiced throughout much of the Middle East, not Iran, um, and throughout Central Asia. Sunni Islam is clearly not higher, is, is not clearly hierarchical, and allows a lot of space for individual definition of what constitutes authority. I think we really have to see that a lot of people 
who come forward and are clerics that are turned to in radical movements, are people who are seen by believers as really, as, as being true Muslims, as being true clerics, as, as being authority figures. Um, and I can come back in questions if people want to talk about this. That's not, I'm not saying that Islam itself is not, is, is itself violent, but I'm saying that there is no, uh, that the definition of, of what is good Islam is really going to depend upon who does the interpretation. And I've met um, fundamentalist clerics, clerics who were clerics who were defining clerics in some of the Islamic movements uh, that then spawned into groups that went to Afghanistan to fight, who were really charismatic, dynamic, devout figures. Um, they were not fighters, and they were not necessarily telling people to fight. Sunni Islam itself has been in ferment for over 150 years as it tries to adjust to Western-dominated understandings of modernity to the West. I mean, I think this is out there, and I see these movements, be they in the Middle East or in Central Asia, as, and they're interconnected if you go to the beginning of the 20th century, and they're interconnected if you go to the end of the 20th century. So people from these movements, intellectual leaders or clerical leaders, you know, they have a global reach that even before um, today's Wi-Fi world. Um, <coughs> this ferment is, it, it is itself dynamic, and I'm going to come back and when I talk about saying that I don't think ISIS can, can be defeated ultimately, it can be militarily defeated in a place, but the movement, this, this ferment, this under, trying to understand why why the West has come to dominate and these countries have been, I won't say left behind, but been subjected to periodic, um, have been subjected to what they consider periodic domination. Um, secular and even non-secular states become actors in this process. Uh, and, and this, I think, is really critical, and it, I'm going to come back to it when I talk about the conclusions about Central Asia, because this is happening there, and this is an area that U.S. policy is, is engaging very clearly on um, by choosing sides that help politicize the internal ferment or dynamism of the faith. As we talk about, not when we talk about ISIS and people that are themselves now at war in parts of the Middle East or threatening terrorist acts in other countries. But when we talk about movements in Islam that we see as roots of violent extremism, that's where I feel we're playing a very dangerous game where, that we can't really understand because I argue that we help politicize the internal ferment or dynamism that's present in the faith. That we ourselves become actors that are used by the actor, that are used by the major chess pieces in this drama, and we don't fully understand it. This dynamism produces differing responses within Islam by Sunni Muslims. So it is, it, you couldn't, I would argue, you can't expect a uniformity of view on these questions among the community of Sunni believers. Um, this lack of hierarchy, I feel, makes the efforts to transform Islam by outside or even inside internal act is very problematic. You fail more than you win, is what I would say. Okay. The arrival of ISIS, I'm going to go very quickly because I want to end soon. I mean, I would just, you know, we know the reasons for the appeal. Um, I think it's very important to see the appeal in the West is very different than the appeal in these countries themselves. So, <clears throat> it's a, the alienation, um, the adventures for the video game generation and one level of alienation is much more a factor in the US or EU than it would be in the Middle East or in Central Asia. There, the search for stability may be really dominant, and ISIS may seem, and I think this has been true in a lot of parts of Syria and Iraq, as the best of a lot of bad choices. And finally, I wouldn't diminish, and I did a lot of interviewing of people that that again were active um, in the 90s in Central Asia, Islamic terrorists or activists, in the 90s, and then some went to Afghanistan and came back, and I interviewed them in Uzbekistan. For some people, it was financial. For other people, it was future rewards, here or beyond. You know, I mean, it was, if this life was so awful, the promise of a future life, you know, had, 
had meaning to some. Okay, then uh, I'm probably going to skip over these. I just wanted you to very quickly, I have to go to the next slide on this one, to see these were when the Russians intervened in um, Syria. I mean, and, and it was hard to get good maps that were in relatively public domain following that. So these two, wait, these two show the, how much was, can, these were airstrikes from September 30th to October 12th, and then these were Russian airstrikes afterwards. And what I'm trying to show in the slides, and again, I don't really have time to go into depth, is how little, I mean, what you see in this one is, you can see Latakia and Tortus, and it, the regime, when the Russians came in, the regime only controlled um, the area, the old Levant, I mean, the area along the Mediterranean Sea and right against the Lebanese border. And large parts of, <coughs> of Syria were under control that was already, I mean, th that had, you know, th that didn't answer to Assad at all. And had the Russians not intervened, he would likely have fallen this winter, or at least the areas that were controlled by non-Syrian -govern non government forces would have been, um, would, would have likely continued to expand. And I want to go back, as you see it more on this map. Uh, I mean, I, I argue that ISIS is really a proto-state because it was extracting revenues. But on this one, too, you can see how much territory they controlled around in Iraq itself um, with, you know, in the gas field. So if the whole area around Fallujah and Ramad, it were, what had come, and now it is now less under ISIS control. So what you have in these maps and what you had in reality were really seriously fractured states, um, causing, now the next slide, what I mean, I see that some of the students from here are going to go to refugee camps, exacerbating what was already a really tr tremendous humanitarian problem. And this, again, these are maps from, pe from late November or early December. This shows the displaced people and where they are from Syria. And the number of displaced people has increased since this period. And the number of dead civilians in Syria has increased since this period. So Russia, as they leave Syria, has put Assad in a much more secure situation, but he hasn't done anything to solve. I mean, you, you haven't addressed, you've weakened the opposition, the various forms of opposition, not simply ISIS, but all forms of Islamic opposition to Assad, um, and you've greatly increase the humanitarian crisis. And it's very hard to get enough information about this. I mean, this is, I think, the greatest tragedy we've seen in, in Europe and in the West more generally since World War II. Now to go just to the conclusion, um, can ISIS be defeated? I would say it can't be defeated. I mean, that we can knock out the people that now call themselves ISIS in some of these places. How we're going to rebuild these places is beyond me. I mean, I can't see anybody coming up with the money necessary to do this. So, uh, <coughs> including the oil-rich Arab states, many of which are themselves teetering with very unstable domestic situations <coughs> with religion and not just an ethnicity as an important um, cleavage in society. So I think we can really count on it, we'll morph on something else. So we can kill ISIS leaders, we can get rid of some of these people, we may even be able to temporarily, or longer than temporarily, restore a semblance and order of some of these places, but who's going to run the countries is like, not a problem, I'm going to find easy to answer. Unfortunately, I'm not one of the smart people that will be approached. Um, but I think we have to count on it morphing into something else. Uh, that that the heroes of ISIS are going to remain in the paragon of Islamic opposition to Western-dominated models of modernization. 
And I think this is likely to occur as long as outside actors continue to intervene in theaters of conflict. I mean, I think in Russia, you know, that there is, the chickens are going to come home to roost among the Islamic population of Russia as it moves forward. This will, this is part of not just a Middle Eastern, um, a, a Middle Eastern dynamism of Islam or dialogue on Islam or m mythology within Islam. It's certainly part of a Russian one. So as long as Islam itself is not reformed, um, this notion of reformation is a Western, con is a Western construct. So you're still going to have this contestation, I think. Um, what does this mean for Central Asia and Kazakhstan? And I'm just going to wrap up now. I have two fast slides. I think it means we will continue to see recruitment of fighters for Syria. Um, I think it means that they will continue to pose risks of their return to their home countries in the event of an ISIS defeat or in the likelihood of an ISIS defeat. Uh, I think there will also be risks posed by those inspired by ISIS who choose to act at home. So just like you can sit in your house, you can go on your computer, you don't have to be recruited for anybody. Um, and you can still, you know, this can serve as, an, as a stimulus for getting some friends together and doing your own terrorist act. And there's the actual acts of attempted recruitment, which, okay. But what I would argue, and this takes me to my last slide, that people are responding to this in probably the, a backwards way. I mean, what I don't think, and I say this to, to my colleagues in Central Asia when I go there three or four times a year, um, I don't think the risks posed by any of the things that I talked about on the previous slides are unique in Central Asia. Um, this is happening all over. If anything, you know, it's happening more in a place like Belgium or England than it is in Central Asia, both numerically and proportionately. Um, so I think that this means that there really has to be serious effort to identify current and direct security threats from abstract security threats. As the Central Asian regimes run around trying to identify violent extremists or um, you have to really talk about, I mean, they're arresting people from, from all sorts of minority Islamic communities, which are, group, Salafists are now illegal throughout the region. Um, groups like the Tablighi Jamaat are illegal. Uh, the Ahmadiyya movement is illegal. These are not groups that are terrorist groups, but they're seen as groups that can be sources of violent extremism, potential sources. So I think that there really has to be attention to distinguishing between current and direct security threats, people who are likely to be armed because they're, partic they're going to violent sites or they are, I mean, I won't spend time, you can all let your imaginations go. Pre you know, what is a, a, an immediate threat? Prevention through ideological re retraining is a dangerous and slippery slope, and that's what they're doing in the region. So they, they take prisoners who have been arrested in, any of, in some of these religious groups that I've talked about that are now illegal, or even S Sunni Hanafi Muslims who are preaching to um, being taught by somebody who's not a state licensed cleric, because every place in Central Asia you have to be licensed, like driving a car. Um, that and they, when they're arrested, they take them and they put them through ideological retraining programs. I mean, this to me is, as I say, a dangerous and slippery slope. Secular actors, again, religious materials are screened, the, um, what can be published, what can be taught in religious schools, all goes through state committees now. Secular actors deciding which Islamic groups to empower involves the state in a dangerous game in which they risk losing and being discredited. I mean, I've worked with the people who do this ideological work with Islam. In some countries, Uzbekistan is a really good example. They actually know what they're doing most of the time. I might not agree with the decisions they're making, but they at least know what they're reading. You know, they are generally people who are scholars of Islam and oftentimes people who themselves are devout believers, although they won't accept all the clerics that disagree with them. But in a place like Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan, the people who make these choices really lack the background to do it. It's under the most educated circumstances, it's very risky to do this. Playing the ethno-communal 
card is dangerous and that is at risk in some of these countries. You saw the map. And finally, my last comment is learning from the fate of aging dynasties. I mean, this is really the greatest risk that Central Asia faces, that these leaders are getting old and the countries are not participatory. This now takes me to the end of the show. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Alcott, for uh, making us feel even more depressed than when we started. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I get blamed for that, doing that all the time, too. Uh, let me uh, invite the audience to ask questions. We'll bring the lights up a little bit yeah, and down yeah, it's very hard a to little see. bit in the front. Now you all have faces. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And uh, let, me, let me start with a question, if I may, to get the ball rolling, and that is... Um, the president, our president, said that the role of the United States vis-a-vis -vis ISIS was to disrupt, dismantle, and ultimately destroy ISIS. Now, you have just told us that that's a losing game. Uh, do you think by now he has uh, changed his view, or, or, or should we expect that we're going to continue in that sort of a mode? In, in the future, and I'm thinking of candidates talking about this as well. Uh, certainly, certainly. Um, I think that, I, I mean, I don't know what the president can say. I, I think of a conversation I once had that was totally off the record with Helmut Sonnenfeld, who was Kissinger's chief of staff or whatever at one point, who said, politicians don't necessarily tell us the truth. They tell us what we want to hear. You heard it here first. <laughs> For sure. I mean, he looked at me and said, you're so naive. You think we tell you the truth. So I, I think that there's an element of that to what Obama is saying, regardless. I mean, and I think that he is saying that, and I don't think as the policy has been applied, we've done a good job of weeding out, you know, deciding who was good and who was bad. But I think he has to say that this violent group that's going around beheading Americans and others is going to be destroyed. Um, and what I'm saying is that you destroy, when you destroy them, I, I admit there's a chance we will destroy them, we're not destroying what has led to them and they're not going to leave the mythology of Islam. They're going to be heroes for the next group of anguished people. That this is, this is a dynamic process. Um, it, it moves forward and the last group killed becomes, especially when they're dead, heroes for another group of people. Because the, the tension that's causing people to join is not disappearing. And if we wind up on Assad's side, which we could in the current situation, that's what I mean by foreign, you know, uh, us engaging in foreign places then America will be seen again as being anti-Islamic. Um, so no, I think, it's, I think it's a losing game, even if you defeat them. Questions from the audience. And they're bringing a microphone to you. Here we go. Uh, my, I'm Ed Dolan from Northport. Uh, thank you for coming and talking about this. I think it's I've spent a little time in Central Asia. And it's a part of the world people don't pay enough attention to, but I had a specific question here. Uh, you mentioned and then sort of veered away from the fact that all of these thousands or hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, of Uzbeks and Tajiks and so forth who've been uh, working at uh, low-level labor in Russia mm -hmm. Uh, are pouring back to their home countries as the Russian economy is in a deep crisis. Uh, how much is this uh, throwing oil on the fire uh, in the short run in, in those countries? Um, it's a really complicated question because they're, the Uzbeks got returned home. Um, many Tajiks didn't and a lot of Tajiks are I mean, it's just stopped sending money home. The Kyrgyz pretty much got to stay in Russia because Russia, uh, because Kyrgyzstan signed on to a union with Russia, an economic union with Russia. The bigger problem is that they're sending home less money. I mean, and 
And the bulk of them, when they do come home, just come home, you know, doing more marginal jobs. I mean, I think the biggest problem is not their return, but the fact that in the long run, this is not a stable solution for the economies of these countries. To me, it's very natural that they work as laborers in Russia. I mean, I joke, you know, they were born to work in, in Russia, and I'm not being sarcastic. The, the, at the end of the Soviet Union, the, demo, the birth rate among European populations was dropping really quickly, and the large Central Asian and Caucasian birth rates were providing labor. I mean, and so they were moving people, in, trying to move them in as laborers. So I think that, and some of the people are not unskilled, some of them are semi-skilled and they're really needed in the Russian industrial establishment to the degree to which it exists. So I think the bigger problem is not the return of these people, but the, the loss of income that the Russian slowdown has brought into Central Asia. And, and that, you know, that makes the social, potential social unrest in these areas greater. I still think it requires a spark in each of these places. And that's where, especially in Tajikistan, where there's a very harsh, a, a change in policy towards religion that has gone from being very tolerant to Islam to very harsh towards Islam, that increases the social risk factor in Tajikistan. I think in Uzbekistan, the policy is always, it hasn't changed appreciably, and they're looking for ways to employ the population. The Kazakh labor force the Kazakhs won't do most jobs that the Uzbeks do. And so increasingly, the, the Uzbek, there's an Uzbek labor force that's coming into Kazakhstan. Um, but again, all of these countries, the statistical information is not one that you'd want to stake your life on its accuracy. Um, much for the reason that Helmut Seinfeld said, you know. <laughs> you, you know, it doesn't help anybody to tell the truth in these settings. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I enjoyed your presentation, and it just gave more support to me, to my thinking for years, as I wonder what the hell we're doing there. I don't see any direct threat to the U.S. coming out of there and a few years ago, I thought, well, we're doing it just to protect our oil supply, but they're going to sell the oil to somebody, whoever pays the money for it. So do you see any reason the United States should even be involved in the region? You're talking about the Middle East or Central Asia? Either. Okay, I mean, Central Asia, we're really not involved in. I mean, we spend very, very little money there. We do military training. It's not a major area of U.S spending. So, With the exception of Afghanistan. But that's not these five countries. Um, no, so I didn't, I didn't include Afghan. I mean, I have strong views on whether we should be there or not. But, <laughs> but and what would, you know, like what's happened there. But, but in, in the five Central Asian countries, I, I don't think we are a major player. I mean, China and Russia are the major players. Um, in the Middle East, I honestly think from the time of the the decision to go into Iraq in 2003, we've made a muck. I mean, I really feel terrible saying that, and I feel that more since I left Washington and just started going through the material full time. I mean, it's, I don't see, I, I, I don't think it was done willfully, but I don't see the next stage. You know, I just don't see what's gonna, I mean, Humpty Dumpty's fallen off the wall, and I just don't see how the pieces are going to be put together again. And the one thing I didn't talk about was the increased role of Iran. Um, and I think that we, we've suffered, America suffered as it, as it tries to shape geopolitics from the isolation of I Iran, because Iran has been a major actor, and now increasingly a major actor in this part of the world and will continue to be. And I think when we focus on Russia, we're really kind of missing, and, and I'm not speaking, I'm not criticizing Iran, I'm just like speaking that this is what they're doing and they are seen in the region as a legitimate actor. I mean, Russia came in to help Assad, but they weren't seen as a legitimate actor. They were guns for hire. Um, whereas Iran is really integrated into, 
into the Middle East in a basic way, and they are also integrated, m much less so than in the Middle East, in, Af in Afghanistan for certain, and in Central Asia. And they're treated as normal in those places. I mean, I've been at a lot of in, in a lot of settings where there are Israni, Iranian diplomats and Iranian presidents on occasion. Um, and there's none of this notion of fear. It's like none of the tension that the, the complexity of dealing with a Russian coming or a Chinese coming. The Iranians, in, it, at least in seen in Central Asia, are seen as pretty straightforward, that they know what their interests are, but they are seen as straightforward geopolitical actors. And there, unlike the Middle East, there's not a large Shia population that they're backing. Uh, you, over there on the uh, balcony. Yeah, go ahead. Can you suggest a non-Western model for modernization in the Middle East that might address some of the attraction of ISIS? Well, it doesn't even have to be, I mean, thank you, it's a really good question. I mean, they've all been good questions, but that one gives me like real range. <laughs> that it, it, it seems to me that the problem is, in large part, state control of Islam and the weakness of the regimes. It's not, it, it's this frustration that leads people to the modernization dilemma. It's not, I don't think it's implicit in Islam. I mean, Islam is its own faith. It's a complex faith. Um, it, it's much more communally, communally oriented than Judaism or Christianity, but it's more the political relationships and, and the way religion is treated as an effort to legitimize these states that cause a lot of the problems. Um, I think, I mean, until there is a strong Islamist government someplace that fails, I think it's going to be very hard to discredit Islam. It's like, it's, this, it's the flavor not ever tried so far. That's why I think what happened in Egypt, I mean, and that's why I think it was really was a, is a strong security state. I mean, Morsi coming to power was, he wasn't ready for power, but no one was really ready to give him full power either. So you don't have his, he never failed. He was heading that way, but he never had the chance to fail under his own weight. And until you have Islamic regimes that fail under their own weight, and you grant they may not fail, because the Iranian regime didn't fail. And it, you know, it, it, but it's Shia and not Sunni, and that's a very different kind of, kind of beast when you, when you try to turn it into a, a regime that is political. I mean, the, the structure of Shiism is, let me think of a way to say it clearly, because I didn't want to leave it as a beast, but the, the structure, Shiism, as opposed to Sunni Islam, Shia Islam is much easier to lead to institutionalization. Um, and that's part of, and the, that's part of the success of the regime. So there's a hierarchy in Shiism it's that you don't a, have in it, the You can have a hierarchy, Sunni. but it's not, I mean, they're still competing warring ayatollahs, you know, competing ayatollahs, but the structure of the faith and the flexibility of the faith is much greater than, than Salafism, um, because Shia Islam has open-ended religious interpretation. It, the Jafari school of law is much more open-ended than the Sunni schools of law. So the ayatollahs or the religious judges have a lot more discretionary power. So you could have an Islamic government of, in Iran that is substantially more tolerant than the current Islamic government, and it would still be Islamic. Um, I don't know if that's... Uh, I just wondered, uh, it's a little removed from the uh, uh, Middle East, well, at the heart of the Middle East. What, what would you think of the likelihood that the uh, Saudi government will last 10 years? And what would happen if they didn't? Uh, thank you for the question. You might have to have me back next year to answer it. Because, no, I'm not being sarcastic, because Saudi is one of the countries I'm 
uh, I feel I have to work on next year because it is at risk now. I mean, you're, it's, and partly it's at risk because of the tensions within Sunni Islam in Saudi Arabia, and partly it's at risk because the Shia minority is pushing for rights of self-rule or, or secession. So I think that, that something, and Iran is certainly playing a, you know, playing a role in this. They would like to see, they're trying to counter Saudi every place they can because they see Saudi as a comeuppance, you know, that they lack the historic and great civilizational rights that the Iranians think, you know, that they've inherited. So I think, I, I think Saudi is going to be hard, pre and now we've just moved over to the next generation until the next, you know, we're still in the generation of the founding of Sa Saudi Arabia in terms of the rulers. We're still all sons of the founder. So until we, ha when you have your transfer of power there, it's going to be a terribly stressful point. I don't think the continuity of this regime is at all guaranteed. I would say just the opposite. Question up here, maybe get the other microphone. Hello. Thank you for addressing an impossible topic. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see the possibility that our fascination in the 20th century with the nation state is going to modify and become something a little bit different over there? We fight about this at home. My husband's sitting right in front of you. He can take off. He feels it's not going to survive. I, I just don't see what comes next other than something that's Hobbesian. I mean, the war of all <laughs> against all. I, you know, so it's, I don't, I, I, so I think that we may have ever smaller nation states, but unless the international community has another way to organize, I. I don't see that happening. I mean, I think what happens in the Middle East is going to be very instructive. You know, will Iraq and Syria hold on with their current boundaries? I'm not at all sure. Jordan is another very fragile state, potentially. Um, I mean, it goes back to that map that I had up there of how they divided things. It's, well, t you know, the, the Kurds are, up there posing their own threat. So I think there's going to be an international tendency to try to glue things together as best as possible, to keep as many of these states within the current boundaries as possible. But again, it, we may just be heading into a period of much more unrest and a lot less reporting about it, because the rebuilding costs in these places are just unbelievable. Last question up here, and then we'll... This guy in the red. Is it up? Uh, okay, I um, want to preface this by saying I just read this recently in the Atlantic magazine so that you don't think I'm delusional or crazy or something. Um, talking about ISIS and the recruiting of the fighters, mm -hmm. and uh, let's see, the... Baghdadi has become the eighth caliphate, recognized mm -hmm. as the eighth caliphate out of the 12, supposedly. Um, so what I'm wondering is, is this idea of the eighth caliphate drawing in fighters, is, is that what they're using to draw in fighters? And is he, does he really believe this stuff or is it possibly just like he can make a, a land and resource and, and money grab using this, this idea? I mean, Which is who he is. yeah, I, he was the head of ISIS al-Baghdadi, who is or is not alive, I'm not sure. I mean, no, I mean, because they were reports. I mean, he is, he himself is seen as a religiously learned figure, unlike his predecessor. And I, I think that this is 
in Islam, really pretty commonplace for somebody to believe that, that they are either because of their wisdom, either because of, I mean, because of their religious learning, either because it was God ordained, going to lead the faithful on earth in this period of time. I, I don't know that that the motivation, that that's required to get people to join. I mean, I think the more important thing is to get people either spiritually or financially to want to sacrifice their life for Allah, to want to go to eternal life and secure their, because you don't just get there yourself, you know, but you make it much more likely that your family will go there and, um, uh, so I think that the, the power of that message for some people is sufficient. In other cases, uh, and this has been true in all these terrorist groups, and that's why Trump said we should kill their families, um, and, and I'm not advocating it, but in a lot of places, people fight as jihadists because if they die, their families get a lot of, you know, get money. Um, and that's a motivation for many poor people, especially if they believe that they're going to an eternal life. So, I, I mean, I think the message is a potentially powerful one, depending upon who's receiving it. I mean, I, I, there are a lot of people taking messages that I have trouble believing, you know? So it's like, at least with this one, I've met people who sincerely, and felt they, I mean, since they met me, you know, they felt they were cheated. They were, it wasn't like in an ISIS camp, but, um, but, but yeah, you know, it's like, all the things I talked about shaping people, I, I think that's one. And it takes a charismatic leader, I think, as part of it. It's very, in Chechnya, you certainly had it. In the Islamic movements in Uzbekistan and in Afghanistan, you had charismatic leaders. It's very hard to re recruit if they're, if somebody who you're associating with is not charismatic on screen or in flesh. Well, it's summed up perhaps uh, by the statement by a Russian general to the effect that it is pretty difficult when you have someone standing in front of you who looks down the barrel of your gun and sees paradise. Mm. Thank Dr. You so much. Alcott, thank you very much for pleasure. a terrific presentation.